Hi, this is Brian Forster coming to you from Paracas in Peru. Do we have sound? Can you hear me okay? No sound? Okay, great. That's good. Um, I'm still kind of new to doing these live streams. Hopefully it's getting better as, as time goes on. Um, I, I'm obviously not doing this every single day, but I had to do one today because yesterday I came on live and uh, announced that we have a, a GoFundMe uh, campaign in order to do independent um, DNA testing of the Paracas elongated skulls because the major um, the fundraiser and testing that we did involving 18 skulls took three and a half years, involved uh, governments, uh, a major benefactor, um, bringing crews down from the United States, uh, you know, lots of flying around and stuff. And so uh, the reason for the fundraiser that started yesterday was in order to make it very simple as simple as possible in terms of uh, there are skulls, not lots of them, but there are skulls in private collections here in Paracas, Peru. And that's where I'm located. That's where I live. I live in Paracas where the elongated sculpture, uh, sorry, culture lived from 3000 or well, 3000 years ago to 2000 years ago. So approximately from 900 BC to 100 AD when they were exterminated by the more famous Nazca culture. And uh, there is growing evidence of that. The Nazca culture were normal looking Native American people. Um, the Paracas were not normal Native American looking people. Those that watched the two previous uh, videos saw that I, I showed the DNA results of the 18 skulls that were tested in the major study that ended in um, at basically January of this year, uh, one of the skulls was not, uh, they were not able to get uh, mitochondrial DNA from that skull. Uh, the other 17, they were successful in getting mitochondrial DNA. They were not successful in getting nuclear DNA because that's uh, much more complicated uh, and a much more expensive process, I believe. But we did get DNA results which is amazing for uh, sampling skulls that are 2,000 plus years old. Uh, your DNA is very easy to have tested because you are alive. These people have not been alive for 2,000 to 3,000 years. And so what happens to uh, DNA is that as soon as you die, the DNA starts to break down. So having your DNA tested is very simple because the strands, the double helix strand is completely intact. But when you go 2,000 to 3,000 years, the DNA has broken down to the point where it's just tiny fragments, maybe 10 segments, uh, 20, 20 segments, 100 segments. And so only the most sophisticated uh, computers in the world, DNA testing facilities, can analyze ancient DNA like that. We're very fortunate in that uh, Paracas is a very desert climate. It's one of the driest environments on the planet, getting half an inch of rainfall per year. And, uh, and so the skulls, uh, in some cases, are perfectly preserved. And also, it depends where you take the DNA from. It's best to take DNA from an intact molar or from the, uh, the marrow of a bone. Uh, you don't take it from the surface. Uh, you have to you have to take a Dremel type tool and drill into the uh, into the marrow part of the skull or a bone in order to take a deep extraction. This has to be done under uh, very sterile circumstances. Uh, you have to, I'll be when I do the testing of the two skulls that I showed yesterday. I'll be in a complete uh, body suit with mask and goggles and gloves and everything like that in order to do it properly. I'll also have my own DNA tested in order to make sure that there is zero contamination of uh, the samples. And so I'm very thankful in that in basically 24 hours, um, the, te the testing is going to cost in the region 
of 3,000 US dollars, maybe as much as $3,600. But for two samples from each skull, that's, uh, that's quite reasonable. And the only facilities, the only personnel involved in this whole thing is me and the lab in Canada. We don't have to go through the governments. We don't have to go through institutions. We don't have to go through universities or whatever. Um, I'm already in contact with the lab. The lab is the one in Thunder Bay, Ontario, that did the previous testing, and they've already sent me the quote. They sent me the, the documentation, and so I'll be uh, doing the sampling in about two weeks after we finish our yearly elongated skull tour of Peru, which we do once a year. And so, amazingly, in 24 hours, we have raised more than the 3,000 US dollars, and that is incredible. Some of the donations were $5, uh, $10, $25. Uh, one person donated 500, which is incredible, and another great individual who wants to remain anonymous, he donated 1,000 US dollars, so that's incredible. I, I had no idea that we would reach the goal in 24 hours, and so, um, there is more money trickling in, and 100% of that will again go to the testing. Uh, having you know been blown away half an hour ago, uh, checking the um, the GoFundMe thing that uh, we had reached our goal, and uh, again more money is trickling in. I thought, well, there's another one that can be tested, because again I'm in contact with people who do have small archaeological collections, like private collections, not public institutions, but this is Paracas, the, the culture of, of this area 2,000 to 3,000 years ago covered quite a large area. There are four major um, royal cemeteries because the elongated skull people were buried in special cemeteries. They weren't buried with the common folk. The common folk were just typical looking humans, but the nobility class of the Paracas uh, were the ones with elongated skulls. And so the majority of the elongated skulls are cranial deformation. They are the result of head binding, but about 5% of them are not. They are very anomalous. This has been shown by more than 30 international physicians who have come to, uh, to visit and see the skulls in our Paracas uh, History Museum of Senior Juan Navarro. And all of them have seen anomalies that they can't explain. The simple thing they would say is, I didn't study this in university, uh, the anomalies. So what I'm going to show you, uh, again, from another private collection, since I'm you know, here in Paracas, most of the elongated skulls uh, are in major institutions in Lima or uh, in Europe or the United States or whatever. Um, but these are, these are like very small collections, just some local person who uh, has an interest in the ancient cultures and has somehow been able to obtain artifacts like pottery and, in rare cases, an elongated skull. So first of all, this, and unfortunately I don't have, uh, I have plastic bags on my hands. It, I'm not really contaminating the skull because, again, any, uh, any sampling we do comes from inside the bone or inside the surface. So this is an example of cranial deformation. You see the forehead and the back of the skull are flattened. And so that is an example of a Paracas person who has had cranial deformation performed starting in childhood as a baby. And then by two and a half to three years old, enough bone has been formed that the skull retains that shape for the rest of that person's life. Now what's curious is there seems to be no sagittal suture. You can see the suture going uh, this way. This is a suture you have, but you also have this suture that comes down this way, and it's missing in this skull. So this is an example of someone who had elongated skull ancestry, but then over the course of time, uh, they started to breed with common local people and um, in due course over the generations, then the normal human characteristics of the skull shape began to become dominant. 
So this is an exam, uh, example, probably near the end of the Caracas period, where they were breeding with normal-looking people. And again, the genetics started to take over, the normal genetics. And so the head binding was a way to try to maintain the look of the elongated skull people. Also, many of you will know that the, uh, the royalty of the Paracas had genetically red hair. This is not Native American. Genetically red hair comes from the Middle Eastern area in, in general. It's not from Ireland or Scotland or Scandinavia. It's from uh, the Middle East or even parts of Eurasia. And that's where we've been able to track down the anomalous DNA um, haplogroups of the Paracas is that, um, again, of the 17 that were sampled and we were able to get um, haplogroup data, uh, only two of those 17 had Native American, ancient Peruvian, um, indigenous DNA, DNA haplogroups. All ancient people or all 100% Native American people who uh, lived or live from Mexico down to Patagonia, the southern tip of South America, they, their ancestry was of only four haplogroups, A, B, C, or D. And those are the haplogroups that crossed over the Bering Land Bridge some 12,000 plus years ago. But the anomalous DNA, which is the majority of the Paracas haplogroups were not A, B, C, or D. No academic is interested whatsoever in these results. And I have the data, I will present this, uh, this data to any academic that wants it. If they're not interested, I don't really care because we've gone beyond that point. It's the same thing when we study the megalithic structures. You go to academics and say, uh, I find it hard to believe that the Inca built some of these structures because they had bronze tools and these things were done in granite. They're not interested in even discussing the topic. So that's why it's up to the 7 billion of us who are interested in the topic uh, to do this kind of work. And so I'm very grateful again to all of you that contributed to uh, the overwhelming success of the fundraising. Uh, that's what I'm going to be doing in future, just very simple relatively small campaigns like this. Um, and so we have covered now the testing of the two skull, uh, skulls that I showed yesterday. And now I'd like to show you one of the classic Paracas. Now, this is an example of probably only 5% of the royalty of the Paracas and most likely the original people. And uh, again, I've probably only seen five or six of these. Most of them you look at and you go, oh, okay, I can see that's cranial deformation. The volume might be a little bit bigger than normal, uh, a normal skull. So, okay, I can understand ceremonial head binding. You know, I get it. Uh, in, in most cases, in almost all other cultures uh, in the world, in times past that performed cranial deformation or had elongated skulls, they are the result of cranial deformation of head binding. But wait till you see this one. This is classic. Now look at the size of the skull. You can see that the cranial volume is greater than normal. Probably in this case, at least 20% larger than normal. You can change the shape of the skull, but you cannot increase the cranial volume. It's impossible. So this is a classic Paracas. This is a female who died about 2,000 years ago, and I want her to be in the next series of testing. Again, we're only gonna be doing this testing of maybe two at a time or one at a time. I may or may not have this one tested in this batch of testing. Uh, it depends if you would like to don donate again to the GoFundMe campaign. Uh, then I will include this one. If not, then I'll wait and do it later. But this, this, is the, this is the beauty. Look at the size of those eye sockets. Much bigger than normal. So the, the whole eye shape and size was different. We also know that uh, the average Paracas person, again, had genetically red hair. 
So that means that they most likely had very light colored skin and likely green or blue eyes. So those are characteristics you do not find in Native American people whose ancestors crossed the Bering Land Bridge. Uh, also, they averaged between five foot ten and six foot one, whereas the Nazca people who came later and took over, they averaged about five foot four. Also, many people don't know that the Nazca lines and geoglyphs extend from Paracas, which is right here, uh, all the way down to Nazca. That's a distance of 150 miles. So the Nazca lines and geoglyphs, the geoglyphs in Nazca that you're, you know about, like the hummingbird and the spider, uh, there are about 30 of them. But between Paracas and Nazca, there are 1,600 more. And most of them are quite small. They're found in an area called Palpa. So if you look that up on the on Google Images, just look up Palpa lines or Palpa geoglyphs, and you'll see some extremely bizarre looking ones. The really weird ones are located in Palpa. The, the normal looking, again, spider, um, condor, monkey, etc. they are outlines of you know, what you expect, simple outlines of animals. Uh, the famous astronaut, uh, archaeologists will admit, was made by the Paracas people. So the Nazca system was made over the course of a thousand years by two different cultures, starting with the Paracas from 500 BC to 100 AD, then the Nazca from 100 AD to about 500 AD. Um, so so oh, most academics don't even recognize the Paracas culture. They call them the pre-Nazca people. But we know now that they are the Paracas. And again, I wanted you to have a look at this skull. This is not the result of head binding. You see this very interesting bump in the forehead here. And here is the suture line that comes across this way but the sagittal suture is completely missing. There is no sagittal suture. Also notice this um, indentation. So here are the two hemispheres of the brain. This is a very complicated shape. As well, all of these little bones that you see here are in fact called Inca bones because they're a characteristic of the royal Inca people. And so since the Paracas also have these bones, it's quite likely that the Paracas to some degree were the ancestors of the Inca, at least part of the bloodline. The, the Inca were a very complex mix of different peoples. The standard idea that they simply evolved at Lake Titicaca and then migrated to Cusco through science and through medical study is being disproven. So I wanted you to see this beautiful classic example of a, this is the true Paracas elongated skull. And once again, in comparison, so this is cranial deformation. It's quite a bit smaller, simple shape, flattened forehead, flattened back of the skull, quite different. So thank you so much. Um, again, for those of you that don't know, we've been able to have some great time not traveling because I, I, you know, we travel so my wife and I travel so much it's crazy. But uh, we've been able to take some time off, and starting on uh, August fifth, we'll be back in Cusco, and we're starting our uh, yearly uh, elongated skull tour, which will include Cusco. Um, Machu Picchu, the Sacred Valley, and uh, looking at megalithic structures and going into museums to look at elongated skulls. Then we, we return to the coast, and we'll be here in Paracas, and we're going to fly over the Nazca Lines. So please look forward to many more um, 4K high-definition videos from me uh, as the result of, of these trips. We're hoping that we're going to have at least one medical professional in our group of uh, visitors that are coming from around the planet with us. Our tours are generally quite small. In this case, we have 15 guests, and that's 
uh, that's good. So if we have a medical professional, then they'll get to see these up close and personal and uh, give us their input, which I will, of course, put on, um, on YouTube. Yeah, actually, we are, uh, we are going to fly over Palpa because the standard way that you do the, the Nazca thing is you drive all the way to Nazca, which is four hours from Paracas. And then you simply go into the tiny airport that's there and you get in a, usually a small plane. Uh, you fly within 10 minutes. You start to see the, uh, the Nazca famous ones, like you'll see the whale, then you'll see the dog and the condor and the hummingbird and monkey, etc. But in this case, we're flying from the city of Ica. Ica is located an hour from here. And so we have to fly all the way from Ica over Nazca. So to get to Nazca, you have to fly over Palpa. And that's where the famous runways are that you've seen in Von Daniken's work and other people's works on the tops of mesas. Uh, there are lots of these little mesas with lots of very strange looking figures. Uh, you have the runways, which are multiple, and then anthropomorphic figures that look like they're half insect, half human. Uh, and then once you pass Palpa, then you get to the giant Nazca Plain. And the Nazca Plain is, is hundreds of square miles, and that's where the famous ones are. 95% of the people who fly over Nazca do so from Nazca itself. And so that's a total trip of about half an hour. You have 15 minutes to look at the geoglyphs and lines, but we're flying from Ica, so that will take more than an hour. And uh, that will give me the opportunity with my new 4K uh, stable equipment, gimbal stuff, uh, to be able to film as much as I can. The, uh, the planes are, are very... Uh, it's a very bumpy ride. It's hard to get really good photographs or video, but if you have a stabilizer like I have, it makes all the difference in the world. Uh, yes, the Inca royal bloodline did have elongated skulls and they were the result of cranial deformation. However, what most people don't know is that the earliest reports by the conquistadors was that they, they saw that some of the royal Inca people had red hair. Uh, that's not generally known. That's not in the Chronicles of the Conquest. Uh, you have to do a lot of digging and do a lot of study locally in Cusco to learn this information. And so it's quite likely that the Royal Inca were, again, a very complex bloodline. They weren't simply Native American people. There was more to them than that. Not, not that there's anything wrong with Native American people. I'm surrounded by them all the time. My wife is one. Uh, so that's basically it for the update. I want to, again, Say thank you. Uh, here is the here is the link. There is the link. If again, if if you would like to donate, I'm not saying you have to. We have enough money to do the study of the two skulls that I showed yesterday. But this one, which is the classic, we can include in the testing. Um, and if we don't raise enough, then I'll simply do another campaign in about two months because it'll take two weeks for me to get the samples and then it'll take the lab about a month to do the, the processing. Uh, the lab is in Thunder Bay, Ontario in Canada. It's called Lakehead University. It is one of only 10 laboratories in the world that can do ancient DNA testing. There's one in Australia, a couple in Germany, uh, three or four in the US, but uh, it's not like you can simply take this, this material to any genetics lab and say, I'd like this analyzed, because it's 2,000 years old. So thank you so much. Look forward to live updates once we get into Cusco on the 5th and for the next 10 days. And then I'll, again, I'll be filming as much as I possibly can. And uh, the way that we release this information, the way that we learn this information is not through the conventional media. It's not through conventional academia anymore. You've seen that as regards everything like fake news, et cetera. It's a peer-to-peer -peer thing. 100% um, of the donations we've received go to the testing. I don't get a single cent out of it. I don't need it. I make enough money doing things like writing books and 
YouTube and selling video footage and blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. This is one thing that I, I'm in love with the ancient Paracas culture. No academic is studying them. I live in Paracas, so why the hell don't I study them? Um, so that's the wonderful thing about, uh, about how, how proud I am of, of what I'm doing here. And I'm very thankful for your interest because all of this ancient information belongs to all of us. It doesn't belong to a little clique of academics. It doesn't belong to governments. It belongs to all of us. This is our collective human history. All of the megalithic structures in the world are our collective history. Um, the ancient peoples of the world are our collective history. Of course, the Inca are a Peruvian treasure in terms of a culture, but I'm sure the, the Inca themselves love it, uh, love the fact that people from a, around the world enjoy studying them and appreciating how immensely uh, complex their culture was because the Spanish Chronicles were corruptions of the history of the Inca. Uh, there's almost nothing written about the Paracas culture. I just uh, completed a book about them, which took me a couple of years, and it contains all of the DNA results from the previous study. If you'd like to get a copy, um, the book is called Beyond the Black Sea. If you look up uh, on Amazon.com, Brian Forster, it's called Beyond the Black Sea, and it is the complete story so far of the ancient Paracas people. And uh, again, it includes all of the DNA results that came from our $100,000 study that was completed in January. All future studies are simply going to be little projects like this, peer to peer, uh, and me dealing directly with the laboratory in Canada. So uh, finally, just final thing, again, I'm not trying to push the, the fundraising thing. It's just, if you are interested, then we're very happy to take your donation. I'll put it in one last time. There. And there's the link and thank you so much. And please look forward to our upcoming adventures in Peru, uh, in the highlands of Peru and the coast. Uh, we're going to England in September uh, to a UFO conference in Holmfirth, which is in West Yorkshire. Then in October, we're going to do our one big tour of Peru and Bolivia. We're going to Puma Punku again with much more equipment for measuring magnetic anomalies. And on and on it goes. My uh, website is hidden inc hiddenincatours.com. And I thank you so much for tuning in. Yes, I'd love to be on Joe Rogan, but uh, I don't have his email address. If you want to email me at my website, how to contact Joe, then I would very much love to be on, on his show. I'm, I think he'd find this stuff fascinating. He's had uh, Graham Hancock and Randall Carlson and many fascinating people on. I would love to do his show. I've had many people say, why not be on Joe Rogan? And I'd love to. So again, from Paracas in Peru, thank you so much for your interest.